the preacher on that particular Sunday had gotten on a roll. You know, preachers can do that sometimes. And he asked a question in the height of his enthusiasm. Now, how many of you believe in heaven? And everybody raised their hand and, and said, how many of you want to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand again, except one gentleman sitting way towards the back. After the service, the preacher found him and said, well, now, I thought you said that you believed in heaven. Well, I do. And then when I asked if you wanted to go to heaven, you didn't raise your hand. And the guy said, well, I thought you were getting up a load to go right now. <laughs> we do believe in heaven. Amen. We're going to be talking over the next several weeks as we move through Lent about God's kingdom, heaven, that is not just present out there somewhere, but is present here. Jesus did say the kingdom of God is among you. So what do we make of this kingdom? Once we start following Jesus, we become citizens of God's kingdom. Obviously, when we're born naturally into the world, we're citizens of this world. But when we are saved, when we decide to accept Jesus as our Savior, we become citizens of God's kingdom. God's kingdom then becomes our primary allegiance. But what do we make of God's kingdom? We're calling this series that will carry through the majority of Lent God's strange kingdom. Strange because, as Corey has already shared with us, it does not operate God's kingdom, as does this world. The rules that work here don't work there, and the world's rules that work in God's kingdom don't work here. Jesus pointed that out in today's scripture. Just to set up that passage for you, Jesus has been arrested. He's now been brought before Pilate, who was the Roman governor of that part of the Roman-occupied kingdom. Jesus is now before Pilate, and by all outward appearances, Jesus is losing if you measure what's happening by the standards of winning and losing that this world would apply. Jesus seems to be losing ground fast. Pilate asked him, so you say that you're a king. That would have been taken very seriously by the emperor over in Rome who presumed that he was king if word got back that there was some other upstart here in this little outlying part of the Roman Empire claiming to be the king that would look like it was flying in the face of the emperor and that would have gone very very badly so Pilate asked so you say you're a king Jesus says you say you said I am the conversation goes back and forth and it becomes apparent through Pilate's actions that he's really trying to help Jesus here. With a word, Pilate could have let him go. But Jesus isn't helping Pilate help him very much. He's just not giving him a whole lot to work with in order to let him go. Pilate even goes out to the people and says, I don't see anything that this guy has really done wrong, but that doesn't seem to work. If we could look inside Jesus' head in this moment. If Jesus had a full conversation with Pilate in this moment, I just imagine that it might have gone something like this. Jesus saying to Pilate, Now look, I know you're trying to help me here. And it's not that I don't appreciate it. I do. But here's what you don't understand, Pilate. My goal is not to win by the standards and measure of this world. In fact, I'm not following the rules of this world. I'm living by the rules 
of a kingdom that you can't see. And that kingdom doesn't work like the kingdoms of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. When you look at how the scene plays out, Jesus doesn't seem to be winning at all by the standards of this world. He seems to be losing. And Pilate just doesn't understand, well, your kingdom is not of this world. Well, you seem to be falling face first, Jesus, into a lot of trouble here, and I'm trying to help you. So Pilate just doesn't understand. Here's what we need to know. Those of us who follow Jesus Christ are supposed to live kingdom-led lives in this world like Jesus did. We're supposed to put the rules of following God's kingdom above the rules of this world. That sounds nice so far, but let me remind you how that played out for Jesus. It did not make his life easier. In fact, following the leading of God's kingdom got Jesus put on a cross. It didn't get him more success and fame in this world. It ended his life by the standards of this world prematurely, even tragically. It got him success in God's kingdom. He went to sit at the right hand of the Father, but it didn't get him success as we measure success in this world. Paul explains why Jesus did what he did in front of Pilate. He said in Philippians that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient to what? Not to winning and losing by this world's measure, but he became obedient to the rules of the kingdom. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death, on a cross. He did not do what worked in this world. He did what worked in the kingdom. Jesus said to Pilate, his kingdom was not of this world. My kingdom doesn't work, Jesus said to him and would say to us, the way this world works. Paul in Philippians ends his passage where he said Jesus became obedient to the rules of another kingdom by saying to the people that would read it, that means us, these hard words. Have this same mind that was in Jesus in you. That God's kingdom comes first. We like thinking that going to church is a very safe thing, that it's, that it's easy, that it'll make us feel better, and sometimes it certainly does that. But it's also true that sometimes standing in front of the gospel is offensive. It challenges my life, as Will Willimon would say. The reality is that living by the rules of God's kingdom will cost you and me in this world. It comes at a price. Here's where we church people get challenged. Here's where I get challenged. Well, I often find myself having the wrong motivation for living a kingdom-led life. I like thinking that if I live a kingdom-led life, if I do it harder and do it better and lean into it more earnestly this week than I did last week, that it will make my life easier. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. The the rules of God's kingdom don't apply here. I like thinking of it. We like thinking of living kingdom-led lives, sort of like that it's really the spiritual version of seven habits of highly successful people, that I can just follow these rules and all my problems go away. My anxiety just melts away to nothing and and the money just starts flowing into my life. 
But the rules of God's kingdom don't apply, don't work here. I was in a prayer group years ago. We would gather and listen to a teaching on cassette tape. Now that tells you that it was years ago. And after the teaching was done, we would talk about it and discuss it, and we would agree and we would disagree. And then we would have our prayer time together. There was a gentleman that I know well, still do, that was part of that group. And more often than not, he would pray the same prayer when his turn for prayer came around. And it would go something like this. Now, Lord, you know, I've been tithing and giving sacrificially to you for many years. So here I am, Lord. I'm showing up to make a withdrawal from my heavenly account. I need, and he would name the amount that he needed. So, Lord, I'll be expecting this to come my way. Amen. I want you to hear the thinking behind that. That if I follow Jesus, if I sacrifice for Jesus well enough, that it's going to work out better for me here. It's going to be easier for me here because God's kingdom will just fit nicely, will be a nice adornment, a nice support system uh, for my life here. Well, how did it end for Jesus? How did it end, the, the earthly life that is, for Paul? How did most of the original followers of Jesus, how did their earthly life end? Most of them, tradition if not history tells us, were martyred, by the way. But this guy's prayer shows us how we want God's kingdom to work. We want it to make life here easier, better. Church, the reality is this. We don't live kingdom-led lives. We don't live by the rules of God's kingdom because they work here because they make life in this world easier. That's not why we do it. That's misplaced motivation. We do it because living lives by the rules of God's kingdom honor the one who died for me and you. We do it because for followers of Jesus, it's the right thing to do, even when it's not the easy thing to do. I live life that honors Jesus best as I know how in my failed way, not because it gets me stuff, not because it makes life easier, but because it honors the one who was thinking of me before I ever first thought of him, because it honors the one who died in my place to make it all right between the Father and me. That's why we do it. The book of 1 Peter gives a strong message along these lines. 1 Peter is one of those very small books on the other side of the book of Hebrews towards the back of your New Testament that we hardly ever get to. 1 Peter was written to Christians that in this world had lost everything. The reason they lost everything was that because persecution towards Christians had broken out in their homeland. And to save their lives, to make a living, they had to flee. They had to leave homes. They didn't even have time to hook up the 21-foot boat sitting in the driveway. They had to leave their financial advisors and 401ks. They had to leave their homes. They had to leave everything. It wasn't this business of following Jesus was tough for them. Think about this. All they had to do was renounce Jesus and they could easily hang on to the boat, their homes, their financial advisors and 401ks and their jobs. Everything would just keep flowing on nice and smooth as it was before. 
How much temptation would there have been to cave in? To let faith in Jesus, living by the rules of God's kingdom, take a back seat to the rules of this world. 1 Peter was written to them. In the opening verses, the writer says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By His great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, listen to this, to an inheritance which is imperishable. That word inheritance, I'm convinced, was intentional. These folks who now have nothing in this world, this business of following Jesus by the rules of this world, if you measure winning and losing just by the view from this world, it's not working so good for them. But here comes the letter of 1 Peter saying, you have an inheritance which is imperishable. Not nobody, not no thing can ever touch the inheritance that is yours as the citizens of God's strange kingdom. I know it's tough for you now. I know you've lost everything here, but look what you got over there in the kingdom. Speaking of this inheritance that is imperishable, he said it is unfading and it is kept in heaven for you. Their inheritance was not here. Their inheritance was in the kingdom of God. And that inheritance happens to be, he goes on, guarded by God's power, though now, in this world, by the standards of winning and losing in this world, though now, for a little while, until you get there, may have to suffer various trials. Following Jesus, living by the rules of God's strange kingdom was costing them everything here. But it built up a phenomenal inheritance for them there. Sometimes we got to choose, church. Are we going to live by the rules of this world and just hope that Following Jesus just kind of makes it better and and makes people like me more and helps me get along easier here. Or are we going to live by the rules of God's kingdom? Sometimes we got to choose. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. We don't live kingdom-led lives because it works here. In fact, living by the rules of God's kingdom while you're in this world will put you out of step with this world. We live instead by the rules of God's kingdom because it honors the one who died for us. Whether living by the rules of that kingdom come easy or whether it is very hard, we don't do it because it works, because... It helps us succeed by the measures of success in this world. We live by the rules of God's kingdom because it honors the one that died for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.